Well, uh, guys, our pattern here at Doxa Church is to gather for worship, and a huge part of what we do in our worship gathering every Sunday morning is to open God's Word, to read it, to interpret it, and then to seek to apply it. And so if you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn over to Daniel chapter 6. If you don't have a copy, we have Bibles dispersed throughout on different seats. You can borrow that. You can have it if you don't have a Bible, and turn over to page 690 in that Bible. And as you find your way to Daniel chapter 6, I want us to consider, I know we've got some kiddos in the room even this morning, that everyone, whether you're small or big, everyone is afraid of something, right? We all have some kind of fear, if we're being honest. But doing a little bit of research, it was interesting to find that there are some unique fears that maybe you don't know about. So let me read some of these for you, and I think we'll get a little chuckle. Uh, The first is xanthophobia. So there's a condition out there where people have a fear of the color yellow. And if you're a five-year-old waiting to get on the school bus, that brings the first day of school a whole new level of intrepidation. Xanthophobia. There's a condition called plutophobia, which is the fear of money. And I don't think many of us have that in America today, but there's a fear of money. There's a blutophobia, which is the fear of bathing. And we all pray in college that our roommate does not have that fear. The fear of bathing, that's not good, folks. There's one called nomophobia, which is the fear of being without a cell phone. And yes, that's a recent development in the last 20 years. There's agoraphobia, which is the fear of fear or the fear of anxiety. There's globophobia, which is the fear of balloons. I can't imagine being afraid of balloons. Maybe it's hot air balloons. I don't know. And this one was my favorite. I don't know if I can even pronounce it, but it's arachibutrophobia which is the fear of peanut butter sticking to the top of your mouth. You all have some kind of fear. My fear is the fear of you finding out what my fear is because then I think you'll use it against me and some sort of prank, but it's actually going to be really scary. So that's my greatest fear. Whatever you have, though, you have some kind of fear. And yet the Bible tells us, doesn't it, friends, over and over and over again, do not fear. Be strong and courageous. It tells us not to fear man, not to fear what man can do, actually not even to fear death itself, but to fear God, to fear him. That is to say, not to be afraid of him, but to have reverence for him and honor and respect for him. And that as we do, other fears will lessen. Well, so far in our study of this prophet Daniel, we've covered five chapters. And in these five chapters, God has taken on one fear after the next. The fear of living in a new place in chapter 1. The fear of insignificance. The fear of a powerful people group. God has overcome the fear of fire in Daniel chapter 3. He's overcome the fear of losing your mind, which he gave to Nebuchadnezzar and then took it away. The fear of being conquered and even the fear of death. And now in this final chapter, if you look at Daniel as a whole, there's 12 chapters. The first six are the narrative stories. The last six are the uh, prophetic visions and prophecies, if you will. In this final story, in these first six chapters, we get to a final fear. And it is the fear of the ferocious beast. Yes, Daniel chapter 6 is Daniel and the lion's den. And this story, if you've been around the church or Christianity at all, it is just provoking, isn't it? It stirs your imagination to to new heights. Not that it's a story by any means. This is a real man with real lions and a real tyrant ruler. But the story of Daniel and the lion's den really makes our hearts skip a beat because we can resonate with fear. We know what it is to be afraid. And if you've ever been around a lion and heard it roar, you know it sends chills down your spine. Lions are the most terrifying of beasts. And yet here in this final test to compromise for God's man, Daniel, we're going to see him overcome with full faith and integrity. And so as we enter into Daniel chapter 6, I thought about doing something about like facing your lions or facing ferocious felines or something like that. But as I prayed on this and meditated, I realized our theme of Daniel is the Most High God. Because this book is ultimately not about Daniel, but about who? It's about God. It's about God. And so amidst this fear that Daniel faces, it's actually going to be his trust in the person and the works, if you will, of the Most High God 
that will get him through. It will be his trust in God's faithfulness, his trustworthiness. We're going to call it his integrity. And it will be his confidence in God's overarching power, his authority, even his sovereignty that will get Daniel through this. So let me give you the big idea, and then we'll develop that, and I'll show you how I derive that big idea from the text. The big idea for this morning is this. It's that God's integrity prevails over each opponent, and his sovereignty rules over every day. Let me explain that. God's integrity rules over every opponent. That is to say, regardless of who or what God faces, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness, his oneness, if you will, or integrity will prevail every single time. If there's ever a question in a, in a conversation or debate, who's lying? I'm going to tell you right now, it's not God. <laughs> if there's ever a question, who's wrong? Every single time, it's not God. If there's ever a, a question of the motives in a scenario, God's motives are never off. They're never incorrect. They're always true. He has full integrity. But at the same time, God rules with utmost power and authority and sovereignty. And he's shown that time and time again over kings and kingdoms, even over a man's mind, over the fiery flame, and now over a ferocious beast. And it's because of that sovereignty that Daniel has a deep-rooted trust, confidence, and faith. Faith. Faith is possible because fate doesn't rule the day, but God does. And so what I want to ask and answer from our text this morning is how can I live with full faith and integrity in a God who has utmost integrity and sovereignty? How can I live with greater and greater faith in light of who God is? And I want to tell you up front, there's going to be three things. It's going to involve more honesty, more dignity, and more faith. So let's jump in with number one, looking at Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. To live with full faith and integrity, I need, first of all, more honesty when living amidst haughty liars. Look at Daniel chapter 1 for a moment. It says in verse 1, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And a quick pause here. Darius is, again, the Medo-Persian king. This is another name for either Cyrus or Guberu, who we saw last week, either the general who conquered or the overarching Persian king. We think it's the same guy. And he's going to establish now layers of government. And in verse 2, it says, Over them there were three officials of whom Daniel was one. Daniel has been promoted four times already just in six chapters. He had set his heart to please God, to do things God's way, and God kept on exalting him. And then it says in verse 2, not only was Daniel one of these three, but to whom the satraps would give an account so that the king would suffer no loss. And then in verse 3 it says, Daniel became distinguished above all other high officials. And so Daniel is rising the ranks yet again, but bear in mind, he's 85 years old. So we started this journey with Daniel when he was 14 in chapter 1. Now he's 85, and he keeps getting promoted. Up to this point, Daniel has served in the equivalent of a congressman. He served in the role as a senator. He served in the role now as secretary of state, you might say. He has held high-ranking positions. And yet he continues to give glory to God. And so in verse 3, it says, Daniel's distinguished above all other high officials because, look at it, an excellent spirit was in him. And we would attribute this to, of course, Daniel's godliness. He was a godly man. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And so Daniel's uh, integrity, if you will, his faithfulness is paying off. It's turning into exaltation and promotion. Not that that's what he was after, but God is choosing to do that. But the story wouldn't be a story without some twist of drama. Verse 4 says that the high officials and satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for any complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found within him. It turns out that government hasn't been or has been corrupt for 
more than just our generation. Whenever you see a glimpse of corruption or faultiness in higher ranking officials, just know this predates even the cross. Since government has existed, there's propensity to go wayward and to err. And here, these government officials want to now plan a devious plan to bring down Daniel. The driving cause, I think, is none other than envy. They're jealous. They're envious of Daniel's role, and so they want to try to catch him in a lie. And I think it's appropriate for us to pause for a moment and just to consider how persuasive culture can be, right? Culture wins the day. And ultimately, if you think about it as parents, when parents exaggerate a lot, what do their kids typically do? They exaggerate. I've heard my own kids do it. When parents tell little white lies, what do kids typically do? When your peers at work or on a team or whatever community you might be in, when your peers have a certain way of relating to one another, it is contagious. And in the same way, entire organizations and countries, any sort of construct can be persuaded into untruthfulness. We can be persuaded into lies. Here's the, here's the application for us today, friends. We are in a culture that does not uphold truth. We are in a culture like Daniel's day and age where these officials began to devise a lie. We are in a culture that just lives in the sea of little white lies. We live in the sea of uh, not full honesty, but if you will, compromise. And one small white lie after the next. And I think what we need is to commit to honesty now. Now, maybe you're saying, well, pastor, I would never do something to someone like what these men are trying to do to Daniel. They're going to try to trap him. They're going to devise a plan not only to get him demoted, but to try to get him killed. And maybe you're saying, I would never lie to that extent. But as a shepherd of a group of sheep, if you will, there's a concern that has developed in my own heart about us as a group of God's people committing to honesty all the way through. To saying our yes must be yes and our no will be no. Honesty, friends, to the Lord is so important. So important. What we're going to see in Daniel 6 is a lack of honesty, and we're going to see how that plays out for them later. But I want to just read over you a few passages of God's word Primarily from Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 12, listen to this, verse 19. It says, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. In Proverbs 12, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Proverbs 19, verse 9, a false witness will not go unpunished. He who breathes out lies will perish. And in Proverbs 6, verse 16, listen to this. It says, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, and a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. I think there's a level of concern for me that I'm a part of too, that we can slide into white lies. And it may come out in a church context by saying that I'll be at a certain place at a certain time and then not following through with it. Right, guys? I mean, I think if we can't be honest and hold true to our word within these walls, then my concern is what are we representing of Christ outside of these walls? God values honesty and truthfulness. And I think that that has to be something that we resolve ahead of time. Lord, I'm going to let my yes be yes and my no be no. I'm going to be a man or a woman of integrity that lives in full faith and that understands that my word matters and it carries something. If we don't, my concern is for your families and your communities and your workplaces and even your reputation among the church family. Guys, I want to encourage you to think deeply about letting your yes be yes and your no be no. Why? Because this is one of the ways that we will live out the reflection of God's character trait of being a God of integrity. 
You tracking with me there? Integrity is the root, it comes from the root of integer, which means one or fullness, which means what I say I do, I do. There's a wholeness and not a duplicitousness, if you will. And so I think in pursuit of both full faith and integrity, first of all, like Daniel, we need to strive for more honesty than our peers around us. These men in Daniel 6 are full of lies and de- devious plans, but Daniel was a man of integrity who was honest. So number one, we've got to pursue honesty. Number two from our text is that to live with full faith and integrity in light of who God is, I need number two, more dignity when dealing with dishonest laws. So now we move not just from the liars that are the opponent of God, but now to the laws themselves, manipulating rules and constructs, if you will. Look at verse 5. It says, Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. And so what they're going to do is they're going to set out to study God's word in order to catch Daniel in a trap. Now, maybe you've known, I mean, it's a whole nother level of deception and depravity to search out another person's religion in order to uh, persecute them with it. And yet, ironically, many have sought out to disprove Christianity by studying the Bible, by studying God's word. And lo and behold, what happens? Many, many have been converted to Christ on a track of trying to prove him wrong. Sadly, though, not this time, not in this instance. Verse 6 continues, Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O king Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors, the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. You see what they're doing here? These high officials, these governing officials are up to no good. This is no bueno here. They didn't just want Daniel to get demoted. They wanted him to be thrown into a lion's den, which surely would mean death. They wanted death. But verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber opened toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed. And he gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Don't you just love this man, Daniel? I mean, I would just say it this way. Daniel's different, isn't he? As a 14-year-old, he shows up 800 miles from home, away from his parents, and he wouldn't compromise his diet. He demands a different diet to the worldwide emperor, Nebuchadnezzar. And now as an 85-year-old man, with an injunction that would surely bring about his death, Daniel does what he always has done. He goes and he prays. He doesn't try to rally support. He doesn't try to cause an uproar and a rebellion. Daniel goes and prays. Daniel is no fair-weathered follower. He's not looking for an easy way out. He knew that serving God and following him wasn't just for the times when he was promoted four times over. But Daniel did what he always did. He leaned in in his relationship with the Lord. Now, just personally, as a side story, when I first got saved, I struggled with this idea of praying before meals. It felt legalistic to me. I thought, hey, we've got freedom in Christ. I can pray in the car. I can pray when I'm running. I can pray at all times. Why do we need to pray before meals? That feels religious to me. And so for a long time, I had to like violate my conscience to take a bite of food at breakfast and at lunch and at dinner just to say, hey, I'm not under the law. I'm under the freedom of the spirit. I'm not going to pray before the meal. But in my own testimony, I realized, but I am called to pray without ceasing. And, and yet a lot of days I wouldn't do it. So I kind of started thinking, I'm like, what are some things that I do every day, kind of regularly throughout the day on a pattern? It's like, well, I brush my teeth. So I could brush, I could pray as I brush my teeth and I get in my car. I could pray when I'm driving. And then I just realized I eat food three times a day. 
And if you skip one of those meals, you start to get hungry, so you eat a snack. And sometimes I eat at nighttime. And I realize that, wait a minute, food is the thing that keeps my body alive, and it's a great opportunity, not only three times a day, to stop and pray, but to thank God for his sustenance. So I'm just telling you, I can be a little bit stubborn sometimes. It took me like a year to come full circle to finally pray before every meal, like I should have just seen Daniel doing so long ago. Did you notice that, though? It says that he would get on his knees and pray three times a day. And guys, if you're a note taker, let me just give you something real practical. Jot this down. It's so helpful what we find here. I want to call this five prayer prescriptions. Five prayer prescriptions from the prayer life of Daniel in this one verse. If you've not prayed for a while, if you're new to the Christian thing, and you're like, man, I don't even know where to start in my prayer life, these are going to be helpful for you. So number one, prayer prescription for Daniel, notice that he prayed alone. He prayed alone. And I would just ask us, do we ever take time to pray alone? Or is it always at church and in small group and with someone else? Mark 135, it says Jesus went alone to pray. Even Jesus prayed alone. Number two, Daniel prayed with a humble posture It says he got down on his knees. Again, a little insight into rebellious Matt. I'm like, we don't have to get on our knees. I can be running and I can pray. I can be driving and I can pray. But then I realized there are times when I need to make myself get on my knees to pray to remind myself who I'm talking to, that I'm talking to a holy, mighty God, and I am his servant down in a posture of worship, just like person after person after person did in the Bible. So number two is, a humble posture. Do you ever pray, friends, on your knees? You should. You should. It reflects submission. Number three is our prayer should be directional. It says right there in the text that he opened his chamber toward Jerusalem. What does that mean? Well, Jerusalem was the place of God's glory. It was the place where the temple dwelt, and I believe as a godly man, Daniel longed for God's glory on the earth. Shouldn't we be praying the same thing? Don't we have it right there? We exist to glorify God by fulfilling the Great Commission. Our prayer should be intentional and directional, missional, if you will, towards seeing more and more people saved and matured in Christ. Number four, our prayer life should be marked by gratitude. Gratitude. Think about this. Daniel's on the verge of becoming catnip, right? He's on the verge of the lion's den, and yet it says here, that he gave thanks before his God. When times are hard, when you're faced with a trial, it's okay if you laugh, by the way, at the catnip joke. That was kind of funny. Uh, Listen, there's gratitude even in the midst of a horrible tragedy that he's about to face. He's able to thank God because he realizes how much manifest grace he's been given. He says thank you. And fifth and finally, there should be a frequency to our prayer life. His prayer life was frequent. Three times a day, every day, which would be 21 times of secluded, humble, directional, (coughs) gratitude-based prayer. How many times do you pray a week like this? Maybe it's zero right now. And if it's zero, I want to say, hey, today's a great day to start. Today's a great day to start praying like this in these five ways. Returning to our story, though, I can't help but think how easy it would have been for Daniel to have taken one day off of prayer. Bear in mind, friends, just so you can stay with the story, these other governing officials are trying to trap Daniel, not only to get him demoted, but even killed. And what they're going to do is they're going to catch him praying to another god. Do you know how easy it would have been for us to have justified taking a break of prayer? Hey, yeah, I've prayed 21 straight days. I'll take today off. Maybe I won't get caught, so I get thrown to these ferocious lions today, so I won't pray. How easy would it have been to do that? And yet Daniel doesn't. Why? Because I think he's marked with dignity. He has more dignity than the dishonest people around him and even their manipulation of the laws. Look at verse 11. These men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, Did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, 
who's one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but he makes petitions three times a day. I mean, I don't know what else to say except for these guys are turds, right? They're just ornery. They're coming after Daniel for just simple and pure devotion to his God, and there's just wickedness and evil within them. As for Daniel, though, he's marked by dignity, he's marked by faith, and he's going to do what he's always done, which is to humble himself in reliant faith upon the one true God. Verse 14, the king when he heard these things, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Now, this is an amazing insight as we work our way toward the actual event of being thrown in the lion's den. This king, he didn't love Yahweh. He wasn't submitted to the one true God. But you know what he did love or who he did love? He loved Daniel. And I just want to ask us as Christians, isn't it an insightful thought to think on Daniel was loved by unbelievers. That means that he lived with some sort of Christian virtue and charity, winsomeness, if you will, in the workplace. Daniel was not by any means a bigot. He wasn't a bulldog with his faith. He never compromised. But there was something that was attractive about Daniel that caused not just him but multiple kings to love this man. And I would just ask, how about you? Are there, Christ- are there non-Christians in your life that love you? Because you represent Christ to them. Because you reflect the character of our Most High God. This king is perturbed that he may have to kill this man that he loves. So verse 15, Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to him, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. They sensed this consternation within the king, and so they, they were going to hold the king to his word. King, you must follow through. And I think this is a, a moment for us, an opportunity, if you will, to consider, right? I'm talking about dignity when dealing with dishonest laws. What are we to do when an authority asks us to do something that goes against God? What are we to do when there are laws that are contrary to God's law, if you will, or to God's word? And I think there's two principles I want to give you, okay? Two principles in thinking about our relation to governing authorities. The first is, is that we are to submit to our government because government is from God. Romans chapter 13 says that government is installed by God for our good to uphold what is true. So rebellion and anarchy is not the way of God. Submission is. But the second principle is that while submission to government is important for God's people, submission to God is more important. Let me say that again. While submission to government is important for God's people, submission to God is even more important. And so we have precedent in our Bibles in Acts chapter 5 when there's a contradiction between God's word and the governing authorities. God's people at the end of the day must say, I will fear God and submit to him at the expense of fearing man and submitting to him. Friends, there may be times in our lives, and we're going to have to choose our battles closely and carefully, where we will have to choose to submit to God and not to man. There may be times where the government no longer represents what is true and good and righteous and trustworthy. And if, particularly if they ask us to do something that will violate our conscience and cause us to go against God's word, This is where we will stand with God and not with man. But here's the key, and this is so insightful from the life of Daniel. I think that it's possible to be right as Christians and yet to be right in the wrong way. Notice that Daniel didn't cause an uproar. He didn't lose his cool. He didn't launch a counterattack against the king. He didn't even file a countersuit or a lawsuit against the Babylonian government. What Daniel did is he humbly, quietly refused to compromise his clear convictions. He went to be by himself, and he prayed to the God of heaven. He prayed to the God of heaven to give him faith to continue, and he was willing to endure regardless of what came his way. He was willing to actually take on the consequences for his rebellion against 
the human government at that time. Isn't that a great example of dignity, of humility, of, I think, Christian character and virtue, even in his disagreement, if you will, and disobedience to the law? Daniel was living in light of the Most High God. The fact that God had integrity caused Daniel to have integrity. The fact that God was sovereign caused Daniel to have faith. And so here's the idea. Our God is a God of integrity, an integrity that prevails over every opponent, whether it's liars or even laws. God is more true, more honest, more faithful than either. But at the same time, our God is sovereign. He has power. He has authority, if you will, that rules over every day. And therefore, we as his people, to live with integrity and full faith, we need to, number one, be honest, even amidst liars. And number two, we need to have dignity, even when the laws around us aren't fair. Amen? Well, hey, as we move now toward the climax of this story, this big act of deliverance, I want to submit to you that it's not Daniel's honesty or his dignity that will deliver him, but it's his confidence in a God who has full integrity and full power or sovereignty over evil. Guys, without a sovereign God over evil, we have no hope. But because he's powerful, we have hope that he can prevail over evil. So number three, for us to live with full faith and integrity, I need number three, more faith when fearing ferocious lions. And yes, I mean that somewhat figuratively. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. And the king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. Here it is, the moment of rubber meeting the road. Daniel is going to be cast into a den den filled with lions, multiple lions who no doubt are ferocious. And yet this king, I think he's genuine in this. I think he really hopes that Daniel's God will show up. I think he wants it to be true. This is earnest. And in verse 17, it says, A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Now, this lion's den probably would have had an escape hatch on the ground and an entry from the top, and I don't know if he didn't want 85-year-old Daniel to either jump out or run out, but they seal it up. They seal it up real tight, both openings, And in 17, sorry, in verse 18, it says, Then the king went to his palace, and he spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. On this particular night, one of these two men would sleep, and one would not. And it might not be the one that you might think. The king was perturbed because he knew what he was doing was not right. But Daniel, as we'll find, was actually delivered. Verse 19, then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of the lions. And as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Two things we need to think about. Number one, what another act of incredible power from the Most High God. God is making a case through this book of Daniel that he is the most high, that he is sovereign over dietary restrictions, sovereign over kings, over kingdoms, over fire, over uh, even the king's mind, driving him away to be like a beast for a while, and now even over lions. Our God is more powerful than even the most ferocious lion, whatever that lion you may face. But friends, I want to I draw out another point from this. If I were to explain to you a scenario where a man is lowered into a tomb, the tomb is sealed, he's thought to be dead, there's a visitor to the tomb the next morning at the break of dawn, there's an angel or a messenger involved in the story, the man is actually found to be alive and he claims that it was the power of God that caused him to be alive, what Bible story would you first most naturally think of? 
And I think that this story here in Daniel chapter 6 is meant to be a precursor, a type, if you will, of the greater man of God who would come, of the greater act of sacrifice and humble uh, humility, if you will, that would lead to an even greater deliverance. You see, in the book of Daniel, God is trying to convince his people, Israel, who are in exile, that they won't be in exile for long. He's showing them act after act of his power to deliver in culmination toward a big deliverance from Babylon back to Israel. But even this whole thing is a setup of the greatest act of deliverance of all time. And I'm talking about what Jesus Christ did at the cross for you and me. That on the cross, Jesus came, he humbly gave himself up, he paid the penalty for our sin, our sin that we've done even today, that by that act of sacrifice, the power of God would be put on display that many souls would be set free. This is the greatest story in all the Bible that all the other stories culminate toward. It's the climax story, if you will, of all of the plan of redemption of all time and all of mankind's history. And you and I are part of that story, friends. That God is a saving God with power who is here to deliver his people. Isn't that good news this morning? Listen, that's the good news of the gospel message, but I want to tell you, if you've forgotten that gospel message or if you've never embraced it, it's not automatically applied to all. You must personally receive the message. You must personally link yourself with the Savior through repentance and faith, turning from your sin, confessing it to God, and clinging to Christ, your Savior and your Lord in faith. And that as you do that, you will be saved that the Spirit of God regenerates the heart and now comes to live in you and keeps you and seals you for that final day of culminating victory and glory where each of us as God's people will be in heaven with him. Isn't that good news this morning? Listen, friends, Daniel in the lion's den is a story that's part of a greater story that culminates with Christ, with Christ hanging on that cross And for us this morning who have trusted in him, that is good news. Daniel testified of that good news in verse 22. And then it says in verse 23 that the king was exceedingly glad. And he commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out of the den. And no kind of harm was found upon him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives, and before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones into pieces. I mean, man, you do not want to cross these ancient Near Eastern kings. Listen, the the point of this final verse here is that this act of deliverance of Daniel was not just because the kiddies were full. This was a true act of power of God showing up and sustaining Daniel's life amidst these ferocious beasts. The ancient Near Eastern king here, Darius, ordered that these men and even their wives and kids be killed. Why? They would do this on a regular basis to keep from any sort of assassination attempt from the family down the road. But the point is this, back to our Christ connection. The same cross that is the source of salvation for us is at the same time a means of condemnation for those who refuse. And it was the same den, the same lion's mouth that God delivered Daniel through that at the end was the source of death and judgment for those who were God's enemies. Friends, there's an irony here that God is able to use one means to gain glory through both salvation and judgment. It will be the rejection of the cross of Christ that will lead many to eternal separation from the kindness of God. And I think the greater point that we see from this for Daniel is that God could have delivered him away from the lions, but he chose to deliver him through the midst of the lions. And so King Darius, now compelled to say something, says in verse 25, to all peoples and nations that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall never be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. 
he who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. And so this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. And I think just the the comment I'll make here is that I don't know that Darius is converted here. I don't know that he truly submitted to Yahweh, but he is praising the name of God because of the works of God. And I just wonder, friends, maybe there's a role for us to help people in our lives to praise the name of God because of his works. Maybe it's our role to testify of his work in our lives and in others' lives to cause others to look to the God of heaven who does work on the earth. In this big picture, God is witnessing to his people at the time, the Jews, of his ability to deliver. Every chapter is a sign of God's power and delivering ability, culminating toward this big deliverance back to Jerusalem. But again, friends, this is pointing to something bigger for us. This story is in our Bibles to show us that God is able to deliver us. And think about it. When he saved us, he could have just snatched us out of the world. He could have taken us away from sin and away from the world, but what he chooses to do is not to take us out of or away from, but to deliver us through. And so while we are not subject to the penalty of sin and we're released from the power of sin, we're still in the presence of sin. And we've got this ongoing battle day in, day out, even as believers against the flesh. And yet God's promise is that he'll deliver us through the battle. In the same way with the world, he could have taken us out of the world and all of us could go colonize out in the middle of nowhere and just be a holy huddle. But that's not God's plan. He doesn't want us to be like the world or with the world, but he wants us to still be in the world. And so his promise, loved ones, for you and me today is that it's not away from, but it's through. It's not away from, but it's through. And what all of this should do for us is it should build an unthinkable, kind of a crazy and insane level of faith. That's the message. If you want it in a nutshell, it's God wants to instill in us greater and greater faith. It's the same sort of faith that's allowed you to be part of this church plant, to jump in with something that's kind of radical and probably different. I don't know how many of you have done something like this before, but you're jumping in and you're committing your souls and yourselves to God in faith that he's going to work. It's the same sort of faith that we're going to need as a church to see community formed around the truth. It's the same sort of faith we're going to ask God for more of, to see more and more lives transformed, more and more baptisms. The same kind of faith we're going to need in prayer to ask God for a permanent facility for our church. And yet for you personally, you're going to need more and more of the same type of faith to get through marriage when you're in rocky roads. For your workplace, when work starts to get hard and they're laying people off. When you get sick, whether short-term sick or long-term sick, it's going to take faith and reliance upon the Lord, isn't it? Is that real? Is that real life? It's faith. And I believe that it's stories like this that give us faith in the one in whom we're placing our faith. That our God is the most high God with full integrity, which means I can trust him, and full sovereignty, which means he's actually able to do stuff. (laughs) He's actually powerful enough to minister to us in time of need. So Christian friends, here's the point. This Christian life is an ongoing walk of faith. And I want to encourage you that Daniel's response to fear, (laughs) back to the beginning, we all have fears, right? Daniel's response to fear was not to fight, nor was it to flight, but it was to have faith. Daniel's fight or flight syndrome actually gave way to a greater thing, which was a humble, subservient faith. And may God do the same in us. Let me give you three questions to ask and answer before we leave here today. We'll call them learning to live. I want to make sure that we don't just learn to learn, but that we actually allow God's word to do its work in us today and throughout the week. Here's the three questions. Number one, have I placed my full faith in the faithful character of God? Guys, I don't know what your view of God is here this morning. Our view of God can be shaped through all kinds of of things, including our own experience. But I want to remind you lovingly this morning that our God is a faithful, trustworthy, steadfast God. And you can count on him every single time. Would you put your full faith in him again today? 
would you place your full faith in our faithful God? Second is which opponent is challenging my faith and integrity right now? If only we could go seclude ourselves and have isolation and just free meditation with God and on his word, that would be glorious, but life isn't that way. We get bombarded with a thousand things that distract us and detract from our faith. So what's number one opponent right now? I challenge you to think about that, even jot it down. What is the number one thing distracting and detracting from full faith in God? To use Daniel 6 language, what lions are you facing, so to speak, right now? And how is God able to enter in and to overcome that opponent? And number three is who needs to hear about his works that they might praise his name? Daniel's steadfast and full faith led to Darius proclaiming the God of Daniel to the entire kingdom. It was because he had witnessed Daniel's faith that led to God showing up and his works that led to praise of his name. Who needs to hear about God's works in your life this week so that they might praise his name. God's integrity prevails over each opponent and his sovereignty rules over every day. May we be a people who believe that and who live in light of that with greater honesty, greater dignity, and greater faith. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and join our hearts together in prayer.